Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Um, I'm Abe Noe Hayes. I'm the research director at the Rich Earth Institute, and it's my pleasure to invite you or to welcome you to the um, first lightning talk and discussion session of the conference. This one is Advances in Nutrient Recovery. So we will be starting with a presentation from Dylan Randall from South Africa. And Dr. Randall is a chemical engineer by training. He's currently a senior lecturer in water quality engineering at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. He heads up the research group focusing on resource recovery from human urine. In 2018, he led the team that produced the world's first bio brick grown from human urine. So um, we'll hear a presentation from Dr. Randall on nitrogen and phosphorus recovery from stabilized human urine. Right. So thanks for that introduction. I'm going to get straight into it. So when we look at resource recovery from urine, we realize that about 90% of the urine is made up of nitrogen, which is fixed as urea. And now this urea degrades in the presence of an enzyme called urease to produce CO2 or carbonate ions, ammonia or ammonium, depending Margo. on the pH of the system. So we can prevent this reaction from occurring by operating at a low pH, but we also recently found that we can also prevent it from happening by operating at a high pH. And actually when we look at it, we see that, so if we allow this reaction to occur, the amount of ammonia being produced will gradually increase if you don't have the enzyme present. But when you have urease present, you see a rapid increase in the amount of ammonia being produced which means that that reaction is occurring. But when you add calcium hydroxide and you still have the enzyme present, you see that the amount of ammonia being produced actually stays pretty stable. In fact, it's not the, the, the addition of the calcium hydroxide, but rather it's the pH of the solution that is affecting this. And I'll explain this in a little more detail by considering the solubility. So if we take a simple example of just sugar dissolving in water and we have a teaspoon of sugar, so think of sugar dissolving in your coffee in the morning, we know that all this sugar would dissolve. If we have a jar of sugar, all of that sugar actually would also dissolve at 100 degrees. In fact, you would need a whopping 4.75 kgs of sugar before no more sugar would dissolve. If we do this at 25 degrees, you would need just 2.2 kgs. And if you do it for a full range of temperatures, you get the solubility curve. So under the curve, you have a undersaturated solution, so all the sugar would dissolve. And on the curve, you have a saturated solution, so just the right amount of sugar dissolves. And above the curve, you have a supersaturated solution. And the difference between the curve and that point would be the amount of solids you have left over. So as we increase the temperature, we see that the solubility of sugar increases. But when we look at the solubility of calcium hydroxide, we see something different. We see that as we increase the temperature, the solubility of calcium hydroxide decreases and is said to have an inverse solubility. We also notice that the amount needed to create a saturated solution is far less than that for sugar. When we look at this in comparison to urine now and water, we see that the composition of the urine and that of water being very different still results in pretty much the same pH when you add calcium hydroxide as a function of temperature. What we also see is that when we add the calcium hydroxide in different types of urine, so these uh, different colored curves represent different types of urine, we see that the amount needed to create a saturated solution is different. And so we recommend a dosage of 10 grams of calcium hydroxide per liter of urine. So to summarize, the amount of calcium hydroxide dissolving depends on the composition and that the saturation pH is fixed at a specific temperature. So this allowed us to develop what I call a passive dosing system where essentially you add your calcium hydroxide in your urine and a little bit of it dissolves, and you add a little more and a little more dissolves, and so on. 
Provided you have enough calcium hydroxide in your container, you will maintain a high pH and you prevent that reaction from occurring and you retain all the urea in solution. So this allowed us to develop a fertilizer producing urinal and it consists of a removable container, a funnel with a splashback to which we add the calcium hydroxide and then you simply add your urine. So from each 25 liter container, we can produce about 280 grams of fertilizer with about a 96% phosphorus recovery in the form of calcium phosphate. And what we are now looking at is making the liquid fertilizer from the treated urine and with the idea of selling this as high grade fertilizer products. And here you see a full range of the kind of prices, at least in South Africa, converted to US dollars that you typically can sell this for. And the idea with this would be to use reverse osmosis where you essentially concentrate the urine, you produce water along with the liquid fertilizer concentrate and you sell it as a niche fertilizer which can be sold for up to 800% more than bulk fertilizer. The beauty about this kind of process is it essentially doesn't have a waste stream because it produces water and a liquid fertilizer. So the next steps are to basically integrate this process where we have our urinal, we filter out the calcium phosphate, and then we concentrate the remaining stream using reverse osmosis to produce water and a liquid fertilizer. But we also took this a little step further where we essentially grew biosolids from the human urine. So now we come back to this reaction, and in this case, we now after the carbonate ion. And the way we did this was, imagine you have sand, you colonize it with bacteria, which produce the enzyme urease, and now you feed the bacteria a urea and a calcium source, which comes from your urine. And what happens is the, the bacteria produce the urease to break down the urea into carbonate ions, which then combine to form calcium carbonate, and essentially you start gluing the loose sand particles together, and when you do it in the shape of a brick, for example, you get a solid forming after four to six days using minimal energy and a complete natural process. And so this is a picture of the bio brick we produced. What we're also looking at is urine collection, at least in the South African context. And the work we are currently doing led to the first installation of a urine collection system in South Africa in the new Xaro headquarters in Gauteng, built by Growth Point Properties. And it's a very simple system. The urine is merely collected from urinals and stored in the basement for subsequent use of fertilizer or liquid fertilizer for the nearby sports fields. So in terms of future urine collection, I imagine buildings having these unisex urinals that produce or limit the amount of water potentially even produce energy, produce fertilizer for local food production, and even produce building material. Essentially, future buildings will become many resource recovery plants. So I leave you with this final thought. Pollution is nothing but the resources we are not harvesting. We allow them to be dispersed because we've been ignorant of their value. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we have some uh, one question here uh, about the odor of the urine in the fertilizer. So I'm asking what that what that odor is. So fortunately, when you stabilize the urine with the calcium hydroxide, the the breakdown of the urea is not possible. So you don't actually have that strong ammonia smell that you would typically have with urine that has been hydrolyzed. So actually. People are going to find me strange for saying this, but once you've stabilized urine with calcium hydroxide, it can actually start smelling aromatic based on the organics that are present in it. And sometimes it has a sweet smell even um, because you don't have the issues with the strong ammonia. Um, yeah, it, it's it's a weird it's a weird smell to describe. I, I think you would you would have to do it yourself and then actually smell it. Um, yeah. It sounds lovely. Um, <laughs> I thought you would say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
we have a question from Tove Larson, and then we'll move to the next presenter. Have you tested the RL process? No, so, so at the moment, the whole project with the RO process has been put on hold because of COVID. Um, but the students have returned to the lab just three weeks ago and they will proceed with that testing. 